We've been in a series on uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. We're actually going to continue that today. So if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And um, I had very strongly considered taking a break from the book of Ecclesiastes today. Of course, today's Mother's Day. And uh, if there's one thing that um, we need that a mother provides, it's that they make us feel special. Man, that's why moms are so amazing. It's why we love them so much. Um, And so uh, much of the book of Ecclesiastes is kind of dark, (laughs) cynical, maybe even bleak at certain points, uh, depending on how you read it. And I thought, well, that's not a great inspiring passage for Mother's Day, you know, about how we're all going to die and life's very difficult. But as, as God's providence would have it, where we came this week in our course of just going through the book of Ecclesiastes is one of the more lighthearted spots in the book. And it's a passage all about relationships, which is perfect for Mother's Day because there's no, really there's no more relationship perhaps that's more meaningful and significant than Mother's Day. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is famous for this saying, perhaps you've heard it, all that I am or all that I hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. The American College of Pediatricians point out that studies consistently show having a mother who is present and nurturing, who's concerned and who's involved does a world of good in a child's life. In fact, they pointed to one particular study from 2012 that was conducted by Washington University School of Medicine, and they concluded that children who received warm maternal nurturing in early childhood uh, ended up developing a larger hippocampus. Now, I don't really know what that is, but I'm pretty sure it's in the brain. So moms, you, are, you have a great responsibility in loving your kids to help them have bigger brains with uh, more computing power and more feeling power. I think, I think we all know that there's no more important relationship in life than that of a mother. And so if you're here this morning and you have a mother whom you love or had a mother maybe that has passed on, would you just take a moment and just tell God thank you right there in your heart. God, thank you for the gift of my mother. And, uh, and, and uh, Jesus had a mother that he loved very, very much. And he provides a wonderful model for us there. Um, we're in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I want to read to you the passage. We're just going to read verses 7 to 12. And you'll see, again, quickly, this passage is different, thankfully, than much of what we read in the difficult book of Ecclesiastes. Here's what God's Word says. Chapter 4, verse 7 and following says, again, I saw futility under the sun. Now that that phrase there is very important in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, Solomon is searching for the meaning of life and it seems everywhere he searches is sort of a dead end or it's futile, right? When he he speaks about life under the sun, he's talking about life here and now. And so in verse seven, he says, hey, here's another way in which I found one of the more common pursuits of life to be futile. He said in verse eight, there's a person without a companion. Right? So he's talking about a life without meaningful relationships, without even a son or brother. And though there is no end to all his struggles, his eyes are still not content with his riches. Who am I struggling for, he asks, and depriving myself of good things? This too is futile and is a miserable task. And so he's envisioning here a life, even a life that by many, many meaningful standards of measure is a very successful life, but the life doesn't have significant loving relationships. And he concludes, even a really ambitious, hardworking, successful life, if it doesn't have relationships that are important and that are nurturing, he says at the end of verse eight, it is futile and a miserable task. Now, why is that? He explains in verse nine, he says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up, but pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one person alone keep warm? And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. He concludes this section on relationships with this well-known phrase, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. Now, our passage is somewhat proverbial sounding today. I want to highlight in it three truths 
about relationships. And if you can understand these truths and if you can live within the parameters of these truths, I think you can live God's vision for what we're calling the good life, the good life. So truth number one about relationships, relationships are your reason for being. Relationships are your reason for being. God made you to be a person in relationship with others. And so to the degree that you have healthy relationships in your life, whether that's relationships with your family or your friends or your neighbors, um, your coworkers, your church family, right? To the degree that you have healthy relationships in your life, you are living or at least able to live what the Bible refers to as the good life, the good life. Here in uh, verse seven and eight, as we've noted, Solomon paints a picture of a really successful person with one big problem, no meaningful relationships in his life. And he, he draws a line under that and he concludes, hey, even with all the riches, all the accomplishments, all the anything most people in the world would be searching for out of their career or their ambition, in the, in the absence of meaningful relationships, our lives just don't amount to much. Now, I'm speaking on a couple of levels here because I think you understand relationships are really important to us both on the human level and on the heavenly level. We were created for relationships, relationship with God, oh yes, but also relationship with each other. One author describes this high achieving person in verse seven and eight with these words. He says, Solomon effectively introduces us here to the company CEO. He's made it all the way to the top of the tree, but he lives there alone, utterly alone. He has no, no children, no family, no friends, and his only companions are his work and his wealth. But it's not as if that is enough. His hours are as long now as they've ever been. He obsesses over his emails and his meetings and reports. When one bonus arrives, he's already thinking of the next one. He can't afford to have a wife and a family because they would just get in the way. And a social life would curb his output. And the only input he needs comes from a screen and some figures anyways. Another person adds this of this successful person with no relationships. He's so successful, he could buy dinner for everyone in the restaurant, but no one wants to sit with him. And that's all right, because he probably doesn't want to sit with them either. We don't want a life like that. And here's why. Relationships are our reason for being. Why am I here? What gives my life purpose? Relationships. Relationships, that's, that's a key part of this, this bright spot in the book of Ecclesiastes. A few weeks ago, Lauren and I were out looking for um, some flowers at the Ebenezer Rose Garden. And uh, while we were out there, um, I was trying to find a story. Uh, it was for something unrelated to today's sermon, but I just, I found this incredibly moving story about the power of relationships and the influence they wield on our sense of purpose. And so I wanna share this story with you. I found it on a devotional site called Guidepost. It says this, it's about a young lady lacking purpose. I stared blankly at the stacks of papers that filled my elderly neighbor's living room that summer day. What had I gotten myself into? I need you to be my eyes, Ruth said. I'm looking for a notebook with a picture of this teapot. And she pointed at a cabinet filled with beautiful porcelain teapots. She said, it's here somewhere. I smiled nervously. Do you remember where you last saw it? Goodness, no, she said. But you'll know it when you see it. This is what my life had come to. Even an 89-year-old woman with bad vision could see that I had nothing better to do than hunt for a dusty old notebook. I had moved back home when I was 28, feeling like a failure, a failure at work, at love, at everything. I was constantly tired and achy, depressed. Nothing interested me. I had always enjoyed crafting, but now I never seemed to have the energy. I couldn't remember the last time I had felt God in my life. Mom kept at me to get involved, to help others, but 
But what could I offer? Tips on how to be a loser? And so when Ruth Thornton called, asking if I could, quote, pop over for a minute, mom had practically pushed me out the door. It'll do you some good, she said. Now I searched through a sea of paperwork. Ruth had moved on to a different topic, how she'd gotten started collecting crosses, and my head was spinning. I don't think I can find it, I said after an hour. Well, that's all right. It'll turn up. They always do. Her optimism baffled me. Maybe upstairs, I thought. There, upstairs, wedged in a corner of a spare bedroom, I found it. Wonderful, Ruth exclaimed. I'll use that in the talk that I'm giving next week. I looked at her in astonishment. Almost 90, and her life was busier than mine. I found myself visiting Ruth several times a week. At first, I'll admit it was just to keep my mom off my back, but there was always something that intrigued me. A book that she suggested I borrow, a pretty pattern in a teacup, one of the crosses in her collection on the wall. One day I arrived to find Ruth sitting in her living room, squinting at a piece of stationery. I need your eyes again, she said. Can you read this letter to me? Sure. I moved a chair next to hers. Dear Ruth, I began reading. I was thinking about the dig that we went on. I looked at her in surprise. Were you an archeologist? No, she said, smiling at the memory. It was just a hobby, but we've stayed in touch. I finished reading the letter and Ruth said, thanks. Now I better write her back. I busied myself organizing some of her books, but I kept glancing at Ruth, carefully writing. She was amazing, a puzzle. How had this woman living in a tiny Iowa town managed to live such a full life? She just never seemed to stop. Surely the letter writer didn't expect an immediate reply, but here was Ruth, hard at work. And soon I realized Ruth wasn't writing just an occasional letter. Nearly every day there was a note for me to read and a letter for her to write. She had collected friends like she had teapots, and she had stories to go with each one, stories of travel and adventure, but also of raising her three children and selling clothes in her and her husband's store in Storm Lake. She had lived a life I could only dream of living. Summer faded into fall. More and more Ruth needed to, me to be her eyes and even her hands. I noticed that she was falling behind in her cleaning and I offered to do her dishes. Ruth asked me to do more tidying up, more odd jobs. Finally, she offered to hire me as a part-time housekeeper. I hesitated, a housekeeper? And then I thought, well, what else have I got going on? It's a deal, Ruth, I said. That winter, Ruth fell and shattered her hip. A son called, would I spend evenings with Ruth in a nursing home while she recovered? They'd be willing to pay. I thought of Ruth lying there alone. How could I refuse? One cold winter night when I was wondering for the millionth time where my life was going, I trudged down the hall to Ruth's room. She seemed so small, so helpless in her bed. And when she saw me, she managed a thin smile. I've been hoping that you would come, she said. A letter came today. Could you read it? I sat by her bed and I quickly read the letter. Anything else, I said? She looked at me hesitantly. Would you mind helping me write a letter back, she said. It was such a simple, obvious request, but for a moment it left me speechless. Ruth needed me. This woman who had lived such a full, rich life truly needed me. I had found my purpose. It had been in plain sight all along. Connecting with others, that's what kept Ruth going. And here she was, her body broken, still wanting to reach out. She needed me to help her touch her world. But more than that, I finally understood there was something that I needed from her. Who should we write, I asked, collecting paper and pen. 
Her face lit up with excitement. When we finished, I looked over at Ruth. There was color in her cheeks. I knew how she felt, like a new person. Ruth left the nursing home and my services were no longer needed. And yet, I no longer thought of visiting Ruth as a job. Several times a week, I found myself thinking of things that I could do for her, baking some banana muffins or finding a poem that I knew she would like, any excuse to drop by. But now Ruth was only a part of my life. I had started making crafts again, reconnecting with friends. One day I found myself making Ruth a gift, stitching together a rainbow of yarns to create a large cross. With each stitch, I felt my heartbeat quicken, my hand moving faster at a still familiar task. I couldn't wait to show Ruth. She held it up admiringly, her eyes twinkling. Thank you, she said. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. This will get a treasured spot in my collection. She paused, and then she looked at me. I so look forward to your visits, she said. You make me feel young again. You have so much energy in life. I wish I had your energy. I looked at her in surprise. Was there someone else in the room? But as my eyes met hers, I realized that Ruth saw someone I was only just now recognizing. My aches, they seemed to have vanished. My spirit, it felt lighter than it had in years. I had learned that every day is an opportunity to learn, to meet someone, to try something new. And frankly, I couldn't wait to start the next lesson. Friends, relationships are your reason for being. Let me share with you a second truth today here in Ecclesiastes 4. It's similar. We is better than me. We is better than me. In verses 9, 10, 11, and 12, Solomon's going to paint a picture of four different scenarios. I'm going to describe them for you in brief. In verse 9, he essentially says, it's better to succeed together than to succeed alone, right? So scenario one, better together than better alone. We know this is true. If you don't believe it's better to succeed together, go to a sporting event where you sit with people you don't even know and your team does something good. What do complete strangers look at each other to do after there's a touchdown or a home run? We give high fives, okay? You don't high five yourself. Why? Because it's better to celebrate together than it is to celebrate alone. Verse number 10, a second scenario where we is better than me. He says it's better to fall or fail together than it is to fail alone. Listen, sometimes in life, you're going to stink it up. <laughs> you're, you're not going to win. You're not going to get the job. You're not going to pass. You're going to make a promise that you, you don't end up keeping. Whatever the case, it's better to fail with people around you that love you and support you than it is to fail alone. There's an old Swedish proverb that goes like this, shared joy is double joy. Shared sorrow is half sorrow. Scenario number three, it's better to endure difficulty together than to endure it alone. Notice verse 11, he says also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. It's a picture of a cold night. You can't change the weather of the night, but you can be with others and together create some warmth. He says in verse 12, it's better to suffer attack together than suffer it alone. Again, all these different scenarios, all the same conclusion, better together than alone. So in good times, in bad times, in hard times, and in unfair times, in any, in every scenario, we is better than me. It's better to do life together than to do life alone. Why is that? I think we all agree, just want to ask a little bit of a philosophical question here. Why is life that way? I think I know why. And the why is our final truth this morning. 
truth number three, we were made for community. That's why. In any and every scenario, we is better than me. Together is better than alone. Why? Because that's how God made us. And we work best when we work according to how we were made. And so I want to point out a couple of types of community that I think are important for us to remember and to um, emphasize in our lives. Number one, a community of family. We celebrate that on days like today. Mother's Day, a community of family. Lauren and I have enjoyed many times quoting this old um, Bell South telephone commercial that featured uh, the late coach Bear Bryant. Now I'm not an Alabama fan, but it's hard not to like the uh, larger than life figure that is Bear Bryant. And there he is sitting at his desk with his aged drawl. And uh, he says, have you called your mama today? I sure wish I could call mine. He says he spoke with all of his players when they were incoming freshmen about the importance of staying connected to their family. Uh, The Christian thinker G.K. Chesterton said this, the most extraordinary thing in the world is an ordinary man with his ordinary wife and their ordinary kids. The most extraordinary thing in the world. Another community that's really important for us is our community of friends. Not just our community of family, but our community of friends I hope you have friends in your life. Personally, I think today it's, it's as difficult, if not more difficult than it's ever been to have meaningful friendships. And, and, and I can tell you why. It's because everywhere we look, we've got these little devices which give, give the appearance, the facade of connecting us with others, right? Through a text message or a social media platform. But those connections, virtual, Okay, not not that they're not real, but they're virtual as opposed to actual. They're not the same. Our hearts need the connections that only friendship can provide. And so I wanna encourage you to do something radical in our day. I, I really believe it's revolutionary to think this way. I want to be a good friend to the friends in my life and I wanna have good friends in my life. That takes some work. It takes investment, meaningful friendship. Finally, a community that is important for us because we were made for community. It's this, it's our community of faith, right? Family, friends, and faith. The Bible teaches that we were all made for a relationship with God And that takes place through Jesus Christ who died on the cross to pay for our sins so that we could have a relationship with our heavenly father. I hope you have that relationship. God made you for that relationship. Secondly though, we need to have a relationship with God's people. And we do that through our church family. So I want to encourage you. Uh, the fact that you're here this morning is wonderful. I hope that God blesses you and that you, you really get something out of our worship service today. But I also want to tell you, uh, I hope that you'll take a next step here in our community of faith by getting involved in some kind of a group like a a Sunday school class or a home group or some ministry that meets on a different time. And, and the main reason is because, you know, here in this room, You know, you may sit near people that you see each week and say, hey, you know, how's your week been? Or when we leave, you may catch a friend out in the the welcome center. But, But part of our walk with God that's really important is that we walk together with other people. And here in our church, um, things like Sunday school, home groups, or some of the other ministries that we have, which meet on a regular basis, they give us the opportunity not just to hear truth or to learn important things or to participate in a worship service, but to do that with other people. And remember, it's always better together than alone. And the reason for that is we were made for community. Now that's not always easy because relationships are hard. And we can often be selfish and self-protective. Relationships really require the best of us. They require us to, to be forgiving They require us to ask for forgiveness. They require us to rub up next to other people and where there's that 
rubbing up next to other people, there will be friction sometimes. But by God's grace and the fruit of the Spirit in our life, we can have meaningful relationships here in our church family. Many of you do. And for those of you that do, I can, I can, I can just only see it, it means the world to you. It's really, really important in your life as an individual. So I want to encourage you. You were made for community. Let's work together to build that sense of community. Let me review as we wind down our sermon time together. Your purpose in life will be found in relationships, a relationship with God and a relationships with others. In almost every circumstance imaginable, we is better than me. The American novelist John Steinbeck wrote these words in his novel, East of Eden. When a man comes to die, no matter what his talents and influence and genius, if he dies unloved, his life must be a failure to him and his dying a cold horror. We were made for relationships. The Bible teaches us that Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Do you know him? That one relationship can change everything in your life. A relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, he loves you already more than you could ever imagine. Jesus loves you. In her book, Grace Untamed, Elise Fitzpatrick wrote these words. How would you live today if you knew at the very bottom of your soul that you were loved? She goes on to say, you are already more loved than you could ever dare hope. This love did not come to you because you are wonderful. It is not something you earned by your good behavior. And that's actually really great news because if God's love were something we could earn by our good behavior, then his love would be something we could lose by our bad behavior. But God's love rests on us because of his gracious choice of us in Christ. And that love is indestructible. The love of God for you has one condition. It's not that you be really good or boring or regimented or stick in the mud. God's not calling you to be a goody two-shoes and give up all the things in life that you think are fun. The one condition for the love of God is this, that you would repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ. And with that move, you will embark upon the greatest relationship you could ever have here under the sun, a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me invite you to bow with me.